hello and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. My name is Farah and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. And so to our speaker this morning, Tristram was raised in Devon. I asked Tristram what inspired him to follow engineering as a career and he responded nothing in particular. He said that he would have liked to have studied architecture, however, when choosing his A-levels, he was not allowed to study art, maths and physics, so instead he studied maths, physics and chemistry. As Tristram went to Topness Comprehensive School, he was also not able to sit the entrance exams for Cambridge or Oxford, as at that time only the public schools arranged for A-level students to sit these exams. In his own time, Tristram sat the entrance exam passed and then had a year to wait before he started Cambridge. So he took himself off at a relatively tender age to the United States. He hired a car, drove down the East Coast along the Southern Edge, up the West Coast and back through Canada to the East Coast again. During his extended road trip, Tristram worked as and where he could. His jobs included whitewashing basements in Manhattan, and mending four T-bird convertibles in San Francisco. He said that he would fix cars during the day and then go cruising the boulevards of San Francisco in the evenings trying to pick up chicks. <laughs> Such a dude. <laughs> Tristram said he was not particularly successful at the latter bit. <laughs> he also made a comment that this was within a society where at the age of 18, it was acceptable to smoke weed and yet not get drunk. Read into that what you may. Tristram studied mechanical sciences at Cambridge and soon realized that he had evolved from the nerdy end of the spectrum at Totnes Comprehensive to being considered quite cool at one of the nerdiest universities in the country. After graduating, he came straight to Arab. Tristram joined the firm in 1981 and has knocked up an impressive 37 years. What he loves about Arab is that he can continue to be a heavy-duty structural engineer, keeping his hands dirty, whilst he is still our leader and indeed our deputy chairman as well. And that's the unusual thing about working here, and actually that's why Tristram remains relatively normal and refreshing as well. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> and finally, given his deep commitment and passion for design, Tristram is only one of 120 in the UK to hold the title of Royal Designer for Industry, which reflects a cross-section of designers from all sectors and professions. And last November, he became the master of the RDI. So it really is my pleasure to introduce the uber-charming Tristram, who will share his story on Sagrada Familia in the making. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah. I must say, this is the most embarrassing introduction I think I've ever had, but thank you for it anyway. Before I start talking about this amazing building, I, must remember, I have a bad habit of referring to me and I as though I did everything. And of course that's never the case, and certainly not on this project. So I'd like to acknowledge the, the Arab team led by Steve McKechnie, half a dozen very bright and promising engineers. And also our partners in Barcelona, 2BMFG, structural engineers who've worked on the project for the last 25 years. And of course ultimately the client. And these are a very special client, the Sagrada Familia Foundation. They are the client, the architect, and the builder. And this is part of the special nature of this project. So I'll start with a bit of history, and then we'll talk more about what's going on today. So back 160 years ago, the Barcelona city had the vision to set out a strategic plan for the city. So this was written in um, 1859 or thereabouts. At that time, only the dark piece in the bottom left, the Gothic Quarter, existed, and a bit round the port. You can see Monjuic Hill, um, bottom left, nothing built on that or planned to be built, although that subsequently did happen. And the most amazing thing is that the plan has eventuated. Now, 160 years later, they stuck to it. You know, this is how Barcelona developed, through this, what's called the Echample, or extension, as an English translation of the Gothic Quarter. So that yellow circle is where Sagrada Familia is. It was a vacant block 
which was acquired by a private trust that decided to build a church for the expiation of sins and in um, honour of the Holy Family. They originally commissioned Francisco Villar as the architect in 1877, and this was the church that he designed. And indeed, in 1882, the crypt was constructed for that church when there was a falling out between Villar and his client on a matter of principle. And he resigned from the project, and somebody who'd worked for him, and not on this project but on other projects, Anthony Gowdy, then 30 years old, was appointed to this most amazing project. And you can see on the right, his ambition was somewhat larger than Villars. <laughs> Villars is the red line, and Anthony's is the grey construction afterwards, which has a, a pivotal bearing on the story later on. At that time, the only thing that Gaudi had really constructed was some lamp posts in the Placa Real and this <laughs> stand of displaying gloves at the World's Fair in, in 1878. So it was quite an amazing choice of architect. Of course, Gaudi then went on to become one of the most famous architects of the 20th century. He, he had a sponsor, uh, Mr. Guell, an industrialist with a lot of money. He designed the Palo Guell. You see here, that was his sort of initial style. He then became much more um, lyrical. This is a, some of the walkways at Colonia Guell, which is a whole collection of houses and a park to the north of Barcelona. The Casa Bayo, where you can see that he's in the modernista era, as they call it in, in Barcelona. It's a bit what an, we might refer to here as the, um, the decorative era. You know, decoration seemed to be all. He went on then to probably his largest and, and most impressive construction, the Casa Mia, a block of flats, also called La Predrera, which means the quarry in Catalan, because it was stone. This building has a basement car park constructed in 1904 for cars. That, you know, the vision of the man is quite extraordinary. And these, by the way, are the chimneys and the rooftop walk on the top of Casimir. And just remember the shape and form of those chimneys because they feature later. So, the last 15 years of Gaudi's life, he really dedicated himself entirely to the temple at Sagrada Familia. And by the way, it's not a cathedral. It is only a church or basilica or temple, depending on which word you want to use. So he built the apse you see on the left, and the nativity facade, which is the east side entrance, you see on the right. And the decorative strategy for the nativity facade is quite incredible. You know, this is all about fecundity, about life, and about the story of the beginnings of the Holy Family. So every sculpture there has meaning. Some of them are slightly quirky. So at the bottom of the two columns on the left is a turtle, because in that direction is the sea. And on the right is a tortoise, because in that direction is the mountains. So every part of Sagrada has been thought about and has meaning. And for me, one of the things I had to learn was that it wasn't just about structure, architecture, and construction, which is my normal area of expertise, if you like. It's also about theological meaning and how these things are representing the religion behind the church. So unfortunately, in 1926, when the church was at this state of construction, Gaudi was knocked over by a tram on his way to his evening prayers. He had at that time become very ascetic. He lived largely on site, slept under his desk, although he still had a beautiful house at Colonia Guell for himself. They didn't identify his body for 48 hours. They thought he was a tramp. Um, and eventually it was determined that it was the famous architect, Anthony Gaudi. Um, so a, <laughs> the detail of this to me is just, just hor horrible. The, the trams go two ways. He looked to his left, nothing was coming, he stepped forward. He looked to his right and there was a tram coming from the right. He stepped back and got hit by a tram from the left. You know, it's just one of those horrible things. So it, it's also slight, slightly um, puzzling to me as to why he constructed the church in this way. Why build two elements from ground to pinnacle and not what would be more conventionally done, build the whole church you know, to, a, to a level, if you like. It's either because he wanted to stamp his own sort of architectural style on the whole building, which again is ironic because the rest of the church is built in a different style that he subsequently developed, or it's because he wanted to raise things up to um, solicit money, because it was all made from private donations. So there's a whole fundraising campaign running alongside the construction. Unfortunately, after he died, the Spanish entered the Civil War in the 30s, before the Second World War, and one of the consequences was the building which held all of his uh, models and drawings was blown up. So most of the documentation Gaudi left behind is destroyed. 
And even today, there are people trying to glue back together the little bits of plaster of Paris in the basement of Sagrada to reconstruct the models that they, as far as they possibly can be. So all the work since then has been trying to sort of interpret, guess, you know, work out what it was that Gaudi intended to do with the rest of the church. In the 50s, construction started again on the Passion Facade. So this is the west side entrance, the opposite to the Nativity Facade. And on the left there is Gaudi's original drawing, and here as constructed. And it is totally different. It is, to me, sort of almost unbelievable that one man had the vision for the Nativity Facade I showed you earlier, and for the Passion Facade you see today. But that is because one is life and the other is death. So this is stark and uncompromising and it tells the story of the death of Jesus. Uh, wonderful sculptures by a, a sculptor called Subarax, who was not a particularly famous sculptor when he started work here. Most people in, in the art world of Barcelona thought he was a poor choice. But I think his sculptures are amazing and, and totally appropriate for that piece of work. Later in Gaudi's life, he became a structural engineer. As far as I'm aware, he had no training in structures, and he had no structural engineer alongside him, but he began to investigate for himself what was the perfect structure for a masonry building. And he worked out this idea of a hanging chain model by which if you invert the structure and make it all in tension and put in little bags of lead shot that would exactly correspond to the weight of the masonry at that location, it will form itself into the perfect structural geometry so that when you make it the other way up, it's all in compression. The masonry, of course, has bed joints that cannot carry tension. Right? They can only take compression and shear in friction through that joint. And therefore, you get this amazing nave that was built now in this century, um, largely since 2000. It is, to some extent, unfortunately built in reinforced concrete clad with stone. So we had a first era of construction was all in monumental masonry. The second era of construction is all in concrete clad with stone because they decided that Barcelona was actually a seismically active region and the church should be resistant to earthquakes. And the result was to make it in reinforced concrete, which is more robust and ductile when we get an earthquake. But what you can also see here is that these structural forms that take the load down themselves in a perfectly um, geometric arrangement means that you don't need flying buttresses, which is what Gaudi was really trying to get. So inside the church, you get both this uplifting feeling of structure, because I think you, your back of your brain, whether you're a structural engineer or not, understands that that works as a pile of masonry or a pile of weight, but also you get this fantastic incoming of light because there are no flying buttresses on the outside to get in the way of the sunlight striking <coughs> the windows. And to me, this is, by the way, the best space I think I've ever been in, you know, and part of the reason I'm so passionate about this project. But he also got really obsessed with geometry, and this is on some of his other projects as well as Sagrada. He became addicted in some ways to ruled surfaces. So every part of Sagrada, um, after the first bits were built, are made of ruled surfaces, typically hyperboloids, which you see here on the left, or hyperbolic paraboloids. And the, all that decoration you see on the right from the ceiling of the nave is just the way the lines that form the two hyperboloids intersect with each other and cause those teeth, if you like, the hanging down. So the decorative elements are also formed by the ruled surface geometry. And you end up with this most amazing ceiling to the whole nave. So on the right of this image, you can see the back of the nativity facade in the slightly neo-Gothic style that he started with. The rest of the building is in the final strict geometric style. On the left, you can see the back of the passion facade. Straight up above you is the bottom of the Jesus Tower, which we'll be talking about later. At the bottom of the picture is the bottom of the Mary Tower, which is really the subject of this talk. And the yellow or gold triangle is, represents God, sitting there underneath that tower, naturally illuminated from the tower above. And the top of the picture is the main nave itself, which will eventually get to the glory facade, the main entrance, of which we have yet to see anything. <coughs> So the challenge that we faced in 2014 was largely this. This is the state of construction in 2014 of the church. And there you can see two sacristies. Well, the one on the right is now constructed. The one on the left hasn't started. This is the Mary Tower, and it sits above the apse 
and vertically above the crypt that was built for Villars Church. The main nave roof is now under construction. This area called the crossing under the Jesus Tower is now constructed. Those are the bases of the Evangelist Towers that you've just seen come up. Here is the pediment of the Passion Facade that actually is already constructed. At the front of the church we have two baptistries that we've just started designing literally last week. The main entrance, the Glory Facade, complete with another four Apostles Towers to make 12. Then we have the Evangelist Towers, which are under construction. <laughs> and finally, towering over the whole thing, is the Jesus Tower. The Jesus Tower, when it's finished, will be 170 metres tall. This will make Sagrada Familia the tallest church in the world. It'll make it the tallest building in Barcelona. And perhaps, only as legend says it, but anyway, it's written in, in Wikipedia, so who am I to contradict it? <laughs> it is one metre shorter than um, the hill at Montjuic, because Gaudi thought that you didn't quite challenge God. It wasn't appropriate. So the challenge here on the left is really that 60% of the church, that in dark brown, was already constructed. 40% of the church in pale brown, yet to be constructed, and the foundation decided they wished to finish construction in 2026. So we have 10 years to do 40%, when the 60% took 130 years. So it was really about how do you speed up construction, also at a time when your site access becomes increasingly limited. As you build more, your access to do things on site reduces. So you have to move to a strategy of off-site construction, or off-site fabrication, if you like, and on-site um, assembly. The second part of the challenge was around this tower, the Mary Tower, that sits above the crypt. And this was actually the reason that the foundation came knocking on our door. The geometry of the tower can be deduced from this model of one of the sacristies, which is made of hyperbolic paraboloids, you can see in red on the right there, then rotated and intersected one with another, gives you the geometry of the tower using that very strict ruled surface definition. And using rhino and grasshopper, as you can see in the middle here, that can be extended to make the height of the Mary Tower. There were no drawings of the Mary Tower itself, even any detail left behind. And in fact, the height of the Mary Towers is a continuing concern Gaudi drew it slightly taller than the evangelists. The powers that be, the theologians of the last century, decided it should be slightly shorter than the evangelists. And the current compromise is it will be exactly the same height as the evangelists. <laughs> and the solution when they came knocking on our door to, to making this tower light enough to sit on the foundations of the crypt, which were put in when they had no idea that the Mary Tower was going to be above the crypt, was to make a steel frame and clad it with lightweight cladding panels that resembled stone, if you will. And, and they came to us because of our experience, amongst others, of the Leadenhall building. So thanks to Richard Rogers and partners who made the connection between Sagrada Familia and Arab, this was the expertise that they came seeking. As it happens, though, I personally have been involved with this load-bearing granite facade at Seville for the Expo in 1992. And more recently, this sandstone sculpture in Sydney, where we pulled sandstone blocks together with stainless steel bars to make arching elements. And so, you know, while they came to us for steelwork, we were prepared to think a little bit more broadly. What are actually the ways of constructing a tower that is in the way that Gaudi would like it to have been and of the weight that we can build above that and how we can do it quickly? And so this is where we get into, you know, exploring the opportunities or ultimately what you could really call design. And I found out quite quickly that a masonry tower of the right lightness, which means that it's only about 300 millimetres thick, as opposed to the Apostle Towers, which are 1.2 metres thick, um, wouldn't work. It didn't have enough weight to withstand wind loads on this shape. But I also found out, by experiment, I, my head is not capable of working out how structures of this complexity actually work, because of this, this sculpted form, on plan, but if we put together panels that are themselves robust going from flute to flute, then actually we get a structure that does work as a pile of masonry. So if we can make big pieces of masonry, you know, five meters by five meters or thereabouts, actually there is a, a system there that might work. But would it work with our actual geometry? The windows that we have don't allow fully braced panels and they produce a shape like this. So I built a finite element model there, and I've looked back actually on my laptop, I built 68 different study models in one week, looking at different things, and learning from each one, and then looking at something else, either forgetting that idea, or trying a new one, or, or 
going off and following it. And this is the eventual um, direction that worked for us. These panels at the worst case for under wind load, the red is tension that cannot be carried by masonry and the green is compression. And you can see as a piece of masonry, it doesn't really work. But if you post tension it using steel, as we had done on that sculpture in Sydney, for example, you can generate a compression field like this. When you add that to the wind stresses, you end up with something that does work. So post tensionary masonry panels of 300 millimeters thick is a viable strategy. And the wonderful thing about working with the foundation is they are their own builders. Within a month of me putting this proposition on the wall at a workshop, the builder had made a panel because he wanted to see, does it work for him? Is it easier or more difficult than the current strategy of making reinforced concrete panels and cladding them with stone? Yeah. And I'm glad to say he was overjoyed with the result. The builder is the second from the left in this picture, and he's a very forward-thinking man. He wants to do new things. It's, it's really refreshing to meet somebody in our industry you know, who wants to do it in different ways and new ways. And in particular, he was happy because he made that panel in a day, and his reinforced concrete stone-clad panels took a week. So we're, we were on to something. It also gave us advantage, this making of things, to test them. So we could do physical testing on this real panel to confirm whether our theoretical assumptions in the computer model were accurate or not, or were suitable or appropriate. And I'm glad to say they were, they were good enough so we could move on with that strategy. So this is a bit of a diversion now, just talking about collaboration and communication. I'm told by a lot of my peers that you have to be able to sketch, otherwise you cannot design. And I would like to tell you that I don't agree with that. In my view, you have to be able to communicate, but there are many different ways of communication, and sketching is only one of them. And on this project, partly because we don't speak Catalan, the Catalonians do speak English to a degree, but because of that language barrier, we do more drawing and uh, modelling, live modelling typically in workshops than, than normally occurs. And you get lots of different ways of communication. We do do traditional sketching, as you see here, because of, I'm of my generation, of course. But you also do computer models all the time at different levels of detail, you know, fully rendered or just crude geometric ones. They make rapid prototyping models all the time. They have five machines at Sagrada running full time. Every time we go to a workshop, there's a new set showing what their design development is. This is what's going on with them. We build models for construction, staging analysis. How does this thing get put together? On the left here is a wonderful model made by the builder. He builds models too to work out, can he get his hand in there to do the bolts up? You know, what's it actually going to be like to put this thing together? The one on the right I, I particularly like, this is made by the architects, where they've prototyped or printed each individual stone block. And there's a little metal rod going through there you can't see, but you can see the spanner that does it up in the front, just to prove to themselves that this post-tension stone idea actually works, at least at model scale. You know? So they can fiddle with it and press on it and get a, a better understanding. And this last one is a wonderful cartoon by our project director, Steve McKechnie, who uses an iPad. So he sketches, but using a modern technology. And what he can do then is zoom in and out and change it and correct it until he's happy with the end result. It's just a different way of preparing material by which you communicate your design intent. Another sort of diversion from the main story is we also got to look at what they call the nucleus, or we would call the core, of the main tower, the Jesus Tower. And when we joined the project, this was going to be a slip form concrete shaft with a concrete stair inside it. But everybody got so excited by the idea of post-tension stone that the question was, could we do the core also in stone? And you can see here from the Queen's House at Greenwich that the idea of stone circular staircases, spiral staircases, cantilevering from their walls, has been around for a very long time. And so we said, yeah, we can probably do this in stone. And you can see on the right, it's a 60-metre tall staircase. So it's not an insignificant one. And it also had the added complexity that it often cantilevered from the window as opposed to from the wall. And the stair itself was also being used as the hoop tie for the shaft. So we, we fell back to now you know, our sort of traditional approach. Why don't we just post-tension it? And you can see there in the details, we put three rods for every tread. Sagrada responded in their way of saying, we'll make one. You can see on the left, again, success. It works. It builds in with the wall. On the right is um, a sneak peek of the next bit of Jesus Tower. I've just been out to look at the um, prototype of this, the mock-up of a very delicate um, glass lift in the middle of the staircase. So this is a, a modern intervention, if you will. So we're trying to do it in a completely different style. 
And we then ran into a, a, a block, right, because we designed this stone <coughs> shaft with its staircase. We decided not to panelise this, but to build it in situ, block by block, because that's the easiest way of interfacing the staircase with its shaft, is to build the shaft, then put in the tread, then continue the shaft. And only post tension the top of it, where it was so lightweight that we needed to post tension it, and the bottom, which has enough mass above it not to need post tensioning, we didn't. But then we had this problem of how does that work in an earthquake? The towers themselves, the wind load, we thought at this time, predominated. But how does unreinforced masonry actually respond in earthquakes? And this, this stumped us at the time. But luckily, we looked around Arab and found that, as, as you often do in Arab, somebody somewhere actually knows how to do this. And we found a team working on a confidential project in Amsterdam where they're looking at how do we model brick buildings in earthquakes. And they developed a whole finite element model, or finite element itself, that will behave in all these different ways, or model all these different failure mechanisms of unreinforced masonry in an earthquake. They've modelled this and tested it against real physical models. So here again, a correlation between the, the theory and the reality to make sure that the theory is standing up to scrutiny, which it does. And ultimately, we get to model our shaft in a nonlinear um, time history analysis using these finite element models. And I'm glad to say that after it wobbles around a bit, we get no more than three millimetres of cracks at the top of the shaft in the worst credible earthquake. So we got a big tick. Then we had another panic. We'd never actually studied the towers under earthquakes because we had taken the assumption that the wind loads were larger than the earthquake loads. And that is true, provided the natural frequency of the church is not very similar to the natural frequency of the towers. And we thought the natural frequency of the church would be quite low, it's very massive, it's quite soft, and it would work as a base isolator, effectively, for the towers. But just in case, we sent our wonderful people from advanced technology and research to site with accelerometers, and of course, we hit the jackpot where the natural frequency of the church was identical to the natural frequency of the towers, and in fact, you therefore get an or a magnification of the earthquake of a factor of six at the bottom of the towers. And then we had to build there for a whole model of the whole church. <laughs> with the towers sitting on top of it, with no knowledge of the actual construction of the church. There are no records of what has been built. We have no idea how things are actually connected together or how they'll work in an earthquake. And we managed to conclude that the towers, with a few changes of bolt sizes, were probably OK one day before the first panel was put up on site. So it was there, just in time, just in case. So the real theme of this is about rethinking construction. So this is about how do you take a project that's been going for 130 years and sort of kickstart it into a different mode of operation. And it starts with the fact that, of course, we have modelled everything in three dimensions and very accurately. Every stone is modelled in Rhino. Every piece of steel is modelled in Tekla. Nobody is producing any shop drawings for this. It's going straight from the model to the production house. You can see that everything is put together the way it's meant to be. There's a panel. We do use some steel columns. They're not strictly necessary structurally, but they gave everybody um, a lot of reassurance as to the behaviour of this in an earthquake, and we use them as the temporary works, so they go in first to support the panel before the panels are all connected together. So then we go to cutting the stone, straight from the rhino models, I say. This is a diamond tip bandsaw. This one's controlled by a robot, but ultimately controlled by a digital you know, process, a computer. This one's not actually ours. This is in a marble quarry in Italy, but the principle is exactly the same. On the left is our actual saw, and the, the turntable is, is rotatable and tiltable, also by computer control. And, and the answer is that you can cut any piece of stone you want, provided it is a ruled surface. So it's just sort of, to me, amazing that today's technology precisely converges with Gaudi's geometric perfection that he was looking for, you know, 100 years ago, and we just get this coincidence in time that we can cut every stone we want. Having cut it to millimetric accuracy, we then get the craftsman. finished piece of stone. I love that combination you know, of, of modern and ancient. And on the right, it is checked using a cardboard template, which is probably the way stone has been checked on the sites of churches and cathedrals 
for a thousand years or more. Then we have it all assembled. Um, we have some CNC machining of the pockets. We have CNC machining of the steel anchor blocks. That's the most difficult challenge, by the way, structurally, is how do you stop the anchor blocks bursting through the stone, which can't carry tension very well at the ends. The builder has thought through the construction process absolutely accurately before starting his, his construction. So this, this video was made before anything on site was actually done or in the construction yard. So every step of the way. This, he said, forces him to think it through, to be precise. It also works as an, an education tool, an education tool for everybody joining the team. You know, if they watch this video, and this is only a, a small excerpt, he's got every single stage from cutting the stone through to put, erecting the things on site. There go the rods into the stone. You know, they have to be dropped in at that stage before the lintel block goes in because of the angle of the rods. The lintel block, by the way, is also post-tension from end to end before it goes on. Um, then we have the insertion of the blocks, and this is what I mean. Every single detail you know, has been thought about. How do we do this? How do we do that? How do you install the rods? And then lastly, how do you come along and jack the tension into them, which makes the whole thing work, which is this operation here. So that's the hydraulic jack going on. It's being pumped up. The nut's being tightened. and the spare end is removed. <laughs> and then we get to the real construction. So we get a kit of parts comes to site. This is just like IKEA on a larger scale. Every single piece of steel required for one panel arrives in one box. You know, all named, all labelled, all accurately put together. There's a jig made for one row of panels. Right? One row of panels is made simultaneously. It uses um, laser cut plywood templates, which are again accurate which make everything go in. Those little round knobs at the bottom, the spherical knobs, they're the guides that guide one panel into the next. We set the builder the challenge of plus or minus one millimetre tolerance on that, that sphere into the hole next door. We said, if you can do that, then we will never have to do any site surveying. You can just put it together and it will work because if you can make it fit, it will be accurate and we can carry on. We don't care where the stones are in between, we just need the points where they connect together to be accurate. And he accepted that challenge and has managed to actually achieve it, which is quite remarkable. So he makes a whole circle of stones off-site, one and a half hours um, north of Barcelona, and then they come to site where they're assembled. And this is the assembly of the first panel on the Mary Tower. Their construction program was to take one hour per panel. The first panel I thought might take four hours. That would be pretty good because I'll learn and I'll be better and better. Actually, the first one went in in 38 minutes. They now quite comfortably put up one row of panels in a day. That takes them about six hours, and they haven't yet faltered in that process. Unfortunately, it takes a month to get another set of panels ready, but at least the crane can be doing other things, because one of the things is hook time, as we all know. And there we are today. The Mary Tower is now halfway up. The Evangelist Towers, you can't see, but they've started behind those scaffolds you can see in the background. And the Jesus Tower itself will start um, later this year. So, why is this such a magical project for me? You know, I would say in my 37 years at Arup, this is the best project I've ever worked on. It's certainly the one that gives me the most pleasure. And why is that? Well, it's, I think it is because it is a, an exemplar of one way of sustainable construction. This is about using natural materials and craft. It's about minimizing the resource required. It's about making things out of their reality not adding decorative elements or layers that maybe are only there for the visual component. It's about using the, the latest technology, both in design and construction, to do that. And it's about long-lasting outcomes. You know, I'm hoping this building will still be there in 500 years, with people still taking the amount of pleasure that I get from visiting it still today. So, so in conclusion, I'd say I, I'm really pleased that I became a structural engineer. <laughs> actually. Uh, I have had and I'm still having you know, a fantastic career and I'm really proud to be part of the construction industry. Thank you. So that's, I'm, I'm over my allotted time by five minutes but I'm still prepared to take any questions if anyone would like to ask any. Yes? Will you stay with the project until it's finished? I hope so. 
Um, as it happens, the, the architectural director, Geordie Fowley, has been on the project for 25 years before he became the architectural director. And we've discovered that we were born in the same year. And we both hope that this will be our, our sort of, you know, what we'll do, and then we'll retire. Yeah. Um, over time, the tension in the tension members will change. Yes. What provision is there for continual monitoring of that change in tension and adjustment if necessary? That's a very good question, and um, you, you might, you're going to find the answer disappointing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Having considered that at some length, actually the creep in the stone um, we found out to be very, very, very small. Um, the, the bars are well sized. The need for um, post tensioning is not really necessary in an ultimate low case. In other words, the fact that there is a tension path is sufficient. So having put in quite a lot of quality control into making sure the tension is right in the first place, <coughs> there is no provision for adjustment. Yeah? It's fascinating seeing you doing a project in Spain using uh, what seems to be a popular sort of construction. Yeah. Do you think there's a challenge to bring that kind of technology back to the UK and make it work here? <coughs> Uh, can I run after giving the answer? Depends what the answer is. It's not just the UK. I think we are all, as an industry, rather slow to develop. It's to do with our chaotic nature. It's to do with the fact we all have to collaborate on projects. It's to do with the fact we're full of SMEs. It's, there, there are so many different reasons. And what we, we, we have very low margins. There's nobody with any capital. Um, we are all tend to be risk averse because of the low margins. You know, and all I can go, I can give you a list of why, if you like. But, but in essence, yes, I think we, should, we could be a bit faster. And we do it in fits and starts. Sometimes you see a, a project where things really take off. And the odd thing is it doesn't seem to be repeated. You know? <laughs> and the next project we sort of slide back, maybe because it's a different combination of people or players. But we have got to watch it a little bit, I think, particularly on the design <coughs> side. I'm not sure that the construction side is that much under threat. But the design side, you know, there are startups now. You know, the, the, the tech industry is going to potentially come and eat our breakfast if we're not careful. You have prop tech and con tech firms, it, it, particularly in the Americas, you know, coming away and nibbling at the edges of the industry. So I do think we have to think a little more deeply and react a little bit more quickly to the opportunity that technology offers. Chris. What, what plans do you have to document this fantastic story? We've heard a beautiful account this morning. How, how are you going to, uh, rather than just seeing the thing, how are you going to pass on that knowledge? Uh, I have, well, this is a tricky one. Outside of Barcelona, of course, we all think it's you know, one of the best projects in the world, just like the Sydney Opera House appeared to be one of the best projects in the world when it was under construction. When I moved to Sydney and I lived there for 20 years, I thought, brilliant, I'm going to be part of Arab and we designed the Sydney Opera House, what could be better? Only to find that inside Sydney, it was the most controversial project there was. <laughs> because the architect had resigned, Arab didn't resign, most of the architects hated us because we carried on with the project, blah de blah de blah This is the same. Inside Barcelona, the um, church is as much disliked as liked for lots of different reasons. So the problem is that um, the foundation would rather just build it than talk about it. Okay. So they're a bit nervous. Now, we're encouraging them to be more so. They, they now, I now have permission to talk. I didn't have permission four years ago to talk. Um, and they uh, are bringing in documentary crews. So the, the punchline is that the, fi the filmmakers are now beginning to make documentaries about it. So hopefully the stories will be recorded. Whether they'll be the right stories, of course. <laughs> yeah. How's the project funded? And, ah, and what's the 2026 date for that, That's a very good question, and it's very simple. Um, tourists pay between 18 and 20 euros to visit it. We get between 3 and 4 million tourists a year. And after running the, the place, doing security, and renovating the existing, which is already needing renovation, there's about 25 million euro left for construction. The 25 millions per annum is exactly what has given them the opportunity to say, we can finish in 2026. It's a lineup of cash flow. It's just then a matter of how you use that cash flow. And we have managed to speed up construction by a factor of 10 without changing the annual cost very much. Could you foresee such a project ever being built in the UK? Yes. Yes, I could. In the end, this is just a, bunch of, a small bunch of people who have decided that this is what they want to do, and, and decided, of course, originally in 1870-something, and then continue to find people who want to do it together. There's nothing... It's a, a totally private sector entity, an, an initiative. There's no government support. There's no actual church, church of... Um, Catholic church support in... It, 
except that they don't take money away. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I, I, why not? Why not? Is there any estimates of what the savings were in terms of efficiency of structure if, uh, if by using this technology in comparison to what would have happened if it was built as originally intended? The, the, the simple one is simply that we are using one quarter of the material. So one quarter of the number of stones have to be cut, placed, and dealt with. Now, on the increase on the other side is adding the steel pieces. I reckon 50%. But more in speed. So it's 50% in, in volume and cost, and probably, and, and say, a factor of 10 in speed. Well, I think everybody in the room was extremely inspired by the talk. And um, I think it's special resonance for us, because in our office, we've just started working on a Christopher Wren church. And uh, the discussion that we've been having with uh, the client has been all about the thing that we're doing here is going to have to be here in 100 years or 200 years. And the weight of those decisions, I think, is just magnified 100 times in what Tristan has to do in, uh, in Barcelona. So it was, it, it was really thought provoking to me as a designer, as well as a, a kind of technical um, experience as well. And, uh, and we are working with some real amazing British craftsmen at the, at the moment um, on um, the project that we're doing. We've just finished in the Shard, actually, has been um, fabricated, actually, in southeast London. Um, 640 individual CNC build parts um, that are then hand finished and cornered and arised um, afterwards and then all assembled on site. And um, that combination of craftsmanship that we have a tradition for here and the new technology, I really identify with that, even though we're at a much smaller scale. Uh, the talk was inspirational. We were uh, four of us in, uh, from different groups, so we met here, breakfast. And the feeling at the end of the talk was, that's exactly why we got involved in the industry in the first place. There's something that is so uh, uplifting about watching a small team of people make impossible things happen on budget, on time, and all those rest things. They're quite superficial by comparison to the passion that you saw in the whole of the program. I mean, and, and uh, it was, it's just such a great way to start the day, these breakfasts. You leave with a smile on your face and you're all set for anything. It was completely inspirational, completely inspirational. I've worked with Tristram over the years, probably for about 30 years. We, our paths have crossed in careers around the world, working on small stuff initially, gradually we crossed paths in Australia, and here we are coming together this morning and he's just made the, the pinnacle of his career in today's talk. Well, I think so much of what we saw this morning is about craft and about the association of craft with design and technology. And that's, that's a, an evolution uh, that is, industry has started to become dissociated. Those skills are, are no longer connected as they historically were. It's great to see that coming back together again. And I think that could translate into a lot of the building we do around the world and in London.